Oh, it's right here, honey. Thank you so much, you guys, for joining me today. Um, so for the Beacon folks who don't know me, uh, my name is Wendy Farmer, and I'm the AVP for our crisis programs. And I am joined today by these wonderful people, um, Kevin and Margaret Hines. Um, they actually run the Kevin and Margaret Hines Foundation. Uh, many of you may know them. Um, Kevin, um, um, I'm so thankful, um, survived a suicide attempt. Was it 2000, Kevin? Near 2000, yeah, Near 20 2000. years ago at, on the 25th of this month. So thankful that you're here. Um, one of the only 1% um, that survive um, um, a jump from the Golden Gate Bridge. And um, he has dedicated his life to telling his story of hope. Um, uh, wrote, wrote Cracked Not Broken, um, um, Surviving and Thriving After an Attempt. Also the amazing um, Suicide the Ripple Effect movie put out several years ago. Um, and he and Margie really have dedicated their, their lives to spreading hope um, through their foundation, um, speaking all over the world and, and really helping to um, give, give people hope, which, I, which um, I, I think they're really hope personified. So did I miss anything? Uh, did I get the basics? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> So I just, I wanted to ask you guys a couple of questions. Um, you know, it is Suicide Prevention Month, so I especially appreciate you joining me today because I know how busy this month is for you. But you know, a lot, Kevin, I wanted to ask you specifically about this. There's a lot of sharing of data during this month, right? So everyone's putting out data about suicide. And I know that that's important, but I think we understand better now that stories of hope are actually some of the most impactful things that we can share. So, and I've seen you tell your story and I've seen, um, you know, the reaction when you tell your story and I've, I've seen it really, I mean, it impact, impacted me when I heard it, but certainly I've seen it impact others. What does telling your story do for you um, as you're, during your continued recovery? How does that help you in telling your story? Well, just as it helps other people find the light at the end of their tunnel, it helps me uh, it's, it's the most therapeutic thing I could ever do is sharing my story with people who are in pain and helping them find a way through that pain to, to a better place. And that, that makes my life worth living. It, it, it is a gift. And um, when I get the privilege to share my story and it has a positive effect, that positive effect trickles down upon me, it has a ripple effect, if you will, right? So uh, in, in, in a positive and powerful and very good way. So it's something that helps me stabilize. It's something that helps me be better mentally well and better brain well, if you will. And it's something that gives me uh, a therapeutic sense of feeling that I, I can't replace. Awesome, it really is. You know, and when we talk about people seeking help, you know, getting personal help, getting professional help when, when someone's feeling really hopeless. And, you know, and we, we talk to people about developing a support network and calling a crisis line and reaching out for family and friends. And I mean, I think those are all important things. But when someone's in that moment, um, what is the best recommendation you have for someone who's in that really dark place to choose life? I think my biggest recommendation in that moment is to not keep that moment to yourself. It's easy for me to say, ask for help. It's harder for you to do it. But in that moment of suicidal crisis, in that moment of immeasurable pain, be bold and tell someone who can empathize with you because a pain shared is a pain halved. And you, you, you know, I realize that as a person that lives with regular thoughts of ending my life, I'll never die that way because I say four simple but effective words to everyone around me. I need help now. And I stay put. I don't move. I ask for help until someone's willing to, to reach out to me and re reach in and, and give me that help that I need. And I've been saved every time. This woman right here has saved me many times. And it's all because I didn't allow my thoughts to become my actions. So I need help now is a good way to start. 
I love that, you know, the pain shared is, is pain halved. Um, I love, I love that. I, I think that's, that's so very true. And I know that Margie is such a huge support to you. Um, and I know she works to teach other people how to support their loved ones. You know, we were talking the other day about how great it is that there's a month to support suicide prevention, but it's really something we need to do every day. It's not just a month, right? Um, and we talked about, you know, we give out crisis numbers, we do all of those things. And I think you said a really important thing, Kevin, that reaching in, you know, we talk to people about reaching out, but how can we teach the average person, Margie, to, to reach in? Um, you know, suicide prevention, like AAS always says, is everyone's business, right? I mean, it's really important. How do we get people to reach in and be comfortable having that conversation? That's a really good question. Um, I think a lot of it has to do, well, some people, you know, a lot of it has to do with if they're ready to share their story and to share their truth. Um, but I think if you reach in and you just ask the question, I believe in brutal honesty and I'm pretty, I'm a pretty direct person. I think it's really important to ask the direct question. Are you thinking of suicide or how are you feeling today? Or, you know, sometimes I go as far to say as you don't look so good. Like you look like you're in some kind of pain and I could be completely wrong but are you, and do you want to talk about it? And making yourself available. I think the person reaching in has to also demonstrate a sense, some sense of, of vulnerability. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I really, I see vulnerability as a strength and not a weakness because it actually opens you up to receiving more, um, more honest communication, more empathy, more kindness, um, and, and more love. Um, I've found that being vulnerable doesn't have to be so difficult um, because it's actually afforded me as a caregiver to Kevin um, a, a whole new world of emotion and a whole new world of, I think, honesty and brutal honesty so that when I say to him, hey, you know, you, what's going on, honey? You know, you don't look like you're really with it today? Is it just brain fog or is it depression or what is it? And I give him permission to speak and I give him a safe space to speak. Um, I, I, as the caregiver, I think have to be, um, I have to care enough and want to, to open those doors um, up for him to, to share his pain or to share his mood or emotions whatever they are with me. And I have to be, I also have to be ready to receive that, right? Like I have to know what to do with that in the event that it's a lot worse than I could even anticipate. So I think, you know, for people to reach in, be prepared, prepare yourself, um, prepare yourself for what you need to do, what you could potentially do when, if you hear something really dire or something, some significant need of your loved one. Also be prepared um, to ask the question and don't be afraid. It's better that you actually ask that question and give your loved one or anyone, really a stranger, the permission to speak their truth. Um, because in our case and in many other cases that we've seen, people we don't even know, but people that have reached out to us, we have seen that when you allow people to share the truth and you you actually ask them the question or you take the time to ask them the question and show them that you, you care there have been so many lives saved so many lives strangers even let alone your loved ones who are right in your own home yeah being being vulnerable enough to ask a really scary question and then being kind of prepared for the answer and you know kind of knowing what to do and and, you know, and I've seen that, you know, just in asking that hard question that the person almost feels a tremendous sense of relief that you're even willing to, to go there, you know, that to ask that really tough question, yeah. that relief is, 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 is pretty palpable um, during that discussion. Really great advice. Thank you, Margie. Um, for either one of you, I guess, hope is a big part. Um, if not, you know, the most important part about telling us a story of survival. What does hope mean to you now? Has that changed over time or what does it mean? I know that's kind of a big question, but what does hope mean to you? 
it means everything. Uh, hope is the starting point to all healing. Hope helps heal. And it, it's never been more important than it is right now. During COVID times and the uncertainty of the nation, issues of foreign policy, people are afraid and they need to have hope in their lives in order to move forward. And I have hope every day, no matter what else is going on around me, uh, even in great amounts of mental pain. And I have that hope uh, partially because of Margaret, but in a, in a big way because I have uh, locked onto the idea that even if I can't see the hope or feel the hope, I know it's there. I just have to keep moving forward. I said that in Suicide the Ripple Effect, and it's more true today than it ever has been. Um, I just have to keep on trudging forward through the cement if I need to, to get to that hope, that light at the end of the tunnel. It's there. You, the reality is sometimes you have to work really, really hard to have that hope, and that's okay. That hard work will pay off because that hope will make you feel like you have possibility, potential, future, um, and, and, um, and, and opportunity. I think hope is, hope is the pathway to joy for me. I think that with hope lights the way to finding joy without hope. There is no joy. There's no happiness. Um, and that's, that's with everything in life. I think that's what it means to me. So it's not just about living, it's about thriving and, and finding true joy. Um, yeah. And, you know, building a life that's, that's worth living, right? Um, beautiful stuff. So one, one last question for you, Margie. You know, certainly you're a tremendous support system to, to Kevin. And, and you've become a support system to many other people um, in the same situation. Um, I've, you know, always marveled at, at your strength. Um, you know, um, what would you say to people out there caring for their loved ones right now um, who are in great pain? Um, how, do, how do you support people during a crisis and afterwards? How, how do you do it? So first, I would say, make sure that you, as the caregiver, are taking care of yourself. Make sure that you are okay. Take care of yourself. It's self-care, self-love, because you can't give what you don't have. So that is, that is key. And oftentimes people forget about that because especially a lot of women are, were born nurturers, right? So we want to take care of people, but we overlook our own self-care. I think it's really important to wake up every morning and say, okay, what do I, what do I need to nourish my soul, myself, so that I am, I am operating with a full glass so that when I give, I still have some left at the end of the day for myself and throughout the day. So I think that's the first thing. Um, second thing is don't give up. Um, I mean, it's, it, you also have to know your limits, right? And your, 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 your limitations and your boundaries. So always respect yourself and love yourself, but that doesn't mean giving, taking care of your loved one and go, going all out, doing everything you can doesn't mean not respecting yourself and not loving yourself. Know your boundaries, know your limitations. Um, I think find what resilience is for yourself and what it means and what you need to be resilient and to be strong. You have to be... I think as a caregiver, you have to be resilient and strong in order to take care of anybody else, whether it's a child or a spouse or anyone else outside of yourself. Um, so I think finding your inner strength is core. It's key. If you don't feel that you are strong enough, that's okay. That's okay. Just make it clear to your loved one. Look, I can't, I can't, I can't be, I'm not okay today. And maybe you need as a caregiver to find someone else to help support you. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in that. Um, sometimes that's a therapist, right? Sometimes it's another family member. For me, I have a huge family, really, really close family, really close family. Um, and I really lean on the women in my family, especially my aunties and my cousins, my grandma, 
to be there for me. Um, I was just raised like that. So I always, I always feel like I have a huge support system and they're solid and it's strong. So I know I always have some, I have someone or some a group to lean on. That for me is what I've found. So find your, find your tribe, find your village, find that support system for yourself, because trust me, you're going to need it at some point. That's so helpful because I think a lot of times caregivers, you know, feel like the world is on their shoulders and it's so good that I think it's probably good for Kevin to know that you're vulnerable too, you know, that, you know, you sometimes need help. Um, and, and it's probably pretty validating that, you know, everybody needs help. It's, you know, everybody needs help sometimes. So. Yes. Even our, our, our motto is, <laughs> our motto is we don't, one, only one of us can be crazy at the same time. <laughs> But the truth is, that's not always the case, especially this year. You know, it's been really rough for me, and I don't do well with uncertainty. Kevin certainly does more. He does much better with uncertainty than I do um, because he deals with bipolar disorder, right? I, I don't have a diagnosis, but he's been the one coaching me through this time of uncertainty. Um, but it's been, it's been rough. It's been rough in terms of not having the same kind of social connection and and physical connection that I'm, that we're used to. So yeah, I'm not thrilled about that, but, but I, I'm really grateful for the time that we have together and the, the fact that we've been really, become really creative with how to find social connection with our support system. Because in addition to being each other's supports, we have a family to lean on. And family doesn't always mean blood relate relatives, right? It can mean friends. It can mean your therapist. It can mean your doctor. It can mean your pharma pharmacist. It could mean your neighbor. Um, so yeah, I think for us, we, we, we try to balance and sometimes it just doesn't work out like that. Sometimes we're both going through a crisis at the same time. For some reason, we always end up laughing about it and getting through it. It's just, I think a lot of it is because we know we're there for each other and we know that we also have a support system. Just knowing that people are there for you makes all the difference in the world. Sometimes you don't even have to tap into them, just knowing that they're there. Knowing they're there. Yeah. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Well, and, and your sense of humor and, you know, the way that, that you can joke about things and, you know, it's so, it's so healthy and it's, it's just such a beautiful thing. So, um, like I said, I always, when I think of hope, I, I really do think of the two of you and um, just the example that you can set for people who are who are going through through the same and and I know that you have helped so many people including me um it's just inspiring to to be with you well thank and you, thank Wendy. you because yeah. you're a part of our support system too so yeah. we're so always grateful. here for you always here for you and can't wait for all of this COVID stuff to be clear so we can we can see eye to eye instead of zoom to zoom yes that's right get hugs be wonderful to see you and any last word, anything else you think people need to know about hope and, um, you know, make this month different, you know, what, what, any last words about it? You know, I think we just need to all consider that being kind and compassionate, loving and caring and empathetic to every person we come into contact with, no matter their behavior toward us, because you never know what they're going through. You never know what they've been through, what they're going through, how much help they need. So giving them that compassion straight off the bat could really make all the difference. Thank you. Thank you guys for making a difference every day. Um, so appreciate you. You bet. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks for having us.